Welcome to Comics Crash Course. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about the 1990s, what many comics fans consider one of the darker eras in our form's history. It's an era of frenzied, perhaps manic highs, dropping to some of the lowest lows, and so many extra pockets. There are some major shifts that occur both on the economic side of the industry and the creative side of the industry. So I'm going to start with the creative issues. While any good student of the form understands that the writing and art work together, one of the things you can kind of notice throughout comics history is a swing in power between artists and writers. Currently, for example, we're in an era where writers seem to be the bigger deal. Uh, people might know G. Willow Wilson's name, but not necessarily Adrian Alfona's when it comes to Miss Marvel, or Brian Michael Bendis's, but not Mark Bagley's. Now, this doesn't mean that people don't know artists or that they don't care, but for the most part, the superstars in the industry right now are, by and large, writers. In the 60s and 70s at Marvel, the artists were definitely the bigger draw. It was less important that Stan Lee wrote the book, because she wrote them all, than that Jack Kirby or Steve Ditko drew it. And this isn't surprising. As I mentioned, Stan Lee wrote everything. And thanks to the Marvel method, well, artists did play a major role in storytelling too. Now, in the 80s, you begin to see a shift, in part thanks to the British invasion I mentioned last week, because you get writers like Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, and Grant Morrison hitting the scene for DC. And at Marvel, Chris Claremont takes over writing duties for almost all of the X books. And well, these are huge hits. But the 90s, in the 90s you see a rise of the power of the artist again. And nowhere was this more true than at Marvel. Now a group of artists, some of them barely out of their teens, gained a huge fan following and with it a ton of power in the company. And when I say these artists were huge, I mean they were huge. So Rob Leafield, who was one of them, was in a Spike Lee directed commercial for Levi Jeans. I think. Wait, so, so I say it and then look down? Or just open it and say it? Fly button? It's more apt to the comics industry. So Chris Claremont had been writing most of the X books for, well, 17 years. He ended up leaving the series due to tension between him and editorial, which started because they were interfering with his plans and making choices in favor of the artists. And who took over those X books after writers like Claremont and Simonson left? Well, in one case, Rob Leafield took over as both the artist and the writer on New Mutants, which changed to X-Force. Likewise, Todd McFarlane, who had been drawing Amazing Spider-Man since 1988, wanted to be more involved in the storytelling, and so announced he'd be leaving the book after number 328 in 1990. So to keep this popular artist around, Marvel allowed McFarlane to launch his own Spider-Man series, which he would both write and draw. So, I can't talk about these guys without, well, talking about these guys. Especially Rob Liefeld. He's easy to make fun of. The pockets, the muscles, the lack of feet, the pockets, the strange layout, and the grotesque anatomy. All of these really popular artists, who are connected for another reason I'll get to shortly, shared some of the stylistic tics that seem so, well, 90s. But Liefeld is like the purest expression of these trends. So what are these tics? Well, part of it is the design of the costume and hair. Um, it's hard to explain why this stuff came into popularity at this point in time, but it did. This is the era of, well, pockets and really, really big guns. But more than that though, and what I think is perhaps the most telling tick, is this increase in lines. Lines that don't really add detail, but these lines give a sense of kinetic energy because there's just so much more information that the page is almost buzzing. Now, comic fans kind of make fun of these artists now, especially Leafield, but they were super popular at the time. Now, there are people who hated them at the time, too. I know a couple of people who quit reading comics because they just weren't into the style shift. But most fans really liked it, and sales went through the roof. So it was a really big deal when, in 1992, Lee Field, Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Mark Silvestri, Eric Larson, Jim Valentino, and Wills Portacio decided to break off from the major studios and form their own new company. And that company is one you might recognize, Image Comics. So Image had two founding principles. First, the company would own no intellectual property except for the company trademark. And that meant that creators would own all of the work and all of the characters they produced. Second, no image partner would interfere creatively or financially with any other partner's work. So this is a major difference from the studio system in which pretty much all artists and writers are work for hire working with the intellectual property of the major studios. Now, Image was part of the second big event of the 1990s, an economic one the crash. So last week I talked about two mini recessions in the 1980s, and a few weeks ago I discussed the way the direct market works, and these are pretty important because they're all related to the crash alongside the speculator market. 
So one of the things the direct market allowed, if you remember, was a way for publishers to create special high-end material for specialty stores. And in the beginning, this tended to be things like graphic novels or limited edition miniseries. However, as the 1980s wore on, this shifted to different kinds of sales gimmicks. So not just story events, but things like collectible objects, variant covers, new number ones, covers with holograms. And these collectible objects sold like story events and crossover events did. So Marvel and DC began to do it with more and more frequency. Now, this notion of collectability encouraged shops to sell multiple copies of a single issue to single buyers. And seeing this emerging market as a kind of get rich scheme, people decided to start opening comic shops. And particularly frequent around this time was that coin and card collector shops ended up getting into the comic business, hoping to make a quick buck. And as a result, a lot of people who weren't necessarily comics fans got into comics collecting on the speculation, speculator market, that these variant covers and new number ones would be as valuable someday as, say, Amazing Fantasy number 15 or Action Comics number one. But they weren't, and they were never going to be. And a few big events hit in a row. The first was Superman number 75. This is the death of Superman. It was perhaps the peak of a speculative market. People lined up to buy 25 copies of this issue. Untrained businesses got into comic book sales just to try to make a buck off of this. And while Superman number 75 did sell well, it wasn't sustainable. The afters didn't sell nearly as well as the single issue did. Then, Image. Now, Image books were immediately popular, but they were regularly really late. Now, remember that due to the direct market, stores have to order three months in advance. Image garnered huge pre-sales, but as I mentioned, they had an issue going to print on time. Thus, the books would arrive six months to sometimes a year late. That meant the people who pre-ordered them had ordered them nine months to a year ago. And a lot of people, especially if they were really only ordering on collectible speculation and not because they wanted to read the story, well, they lost interest or forgot. And so comic book stores were left with massive stocks of image books that they had paid for and couldn't return. Then, in 1994, Marvel decided they'd create their own distributor, and decided to do that by buying the distributor Heroes World. They would only distribute through their distributor. And as a result, small distributors had trouble keeping up. They began to fold without the ability to distribute Marvel Comics. At the same time, one of the nation's largest distributors, Diamond, saw the writing on the wall and began negotiating contracts with other publishers, including an exclusive contract with DC Comics. And well, it turns out that distribution wasn't as easy as Marvel thought, and within a year, Heroes World began to struggle. It closed in 1997, and Marvel returned to Diamond, leaving Diamond with a virtual monopoly on the comics distribution industry. So in a nutshell, here's what happened on the first half of the 90s. A distribution monopoly developed. The speculative market led to overly rapid market growth and left stores oversupplied and without demand. As a result, a huge number of publishers closed, including Entity, Comics, Tops Comics, Defiant Comics, Broadway, and Techno Comics. The monopoly created a two-thirds value loss to the distribution market, and the number of comic shops in the U.S. was cut literally in half within a few years. And that's why a shadow falls over the face of American comics fans when you ask them about the 1990s. Now, to me, one of the most tragic victims of the crash is Milestone Comics. It was founded by Dwayne McDuffie, Dennis Cowan, Michael Davis, and Derek T. Dingle, and Milestone explicitly worked to represent minority characters in mainstream comics. They were published through DC and put out great titles like Hardware, Blood Syndicate, Icon, Static, and Zombie with amazing creative teams. The problem is that they began publishing in 1993. They got lost in the miasma of new universes being launched and new publishers being launched left, right, and center. And then the crash hit, and, well... But if you get a chance, check out these comics. They're, they're really, really excellent stuff. And the 90s wasn't all bad. Most of the darkness happened on the mainstream side of the industry. In the world of alternative comics, a lot of great publishers were being founded. Dark Horse was founded in 1986, Drawn and Quarterly in 1990, and then Top Shelf and Oni in 1997. However, with those last two, we're beginning to transition to the current era. Sort of. Still 20 years ago. Hmm. Anyway, that'll be next time. So I'll see you then. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and, as always, to hit subscribe.